Well, how's it going, everyone? It's been a minute or two. Uh, so a lot's happened in the past probably about two to three weeks since I've done a video. So uh, let me quickly catch you up to date. For those who don't care about my life or anything that's going on and haven't seen my Twitter account or my Facebook, uh, you can probably skip the next two or three minutes. So I uh, got accepted to a PhD program in New Testament. Uh, I won't tell you where and with whom. Uh, that information is available on Twitter at the moment and Facebook, um, just in case uh, something goes wrong and I have to drop out of the program and I don't want it on video record of where I went and who I was studying with and all that sort of stuff. Once I get through the initial stage of my program, probably in October, I'll probably tell you, of course, I may forget and then just tell you anyway in the next video. So, you know, sorry. Um, but yeah, started that. Uh, Nolan, our firstborn, our only born, is uh, now one years old. He turned one uh, yesterday, uh, and today is the 15th, uh, with about an hour and a half left in the day. Uh, so yeah, it has been, it's been a few days. It's been a few days. So um, getting up to speed with entire sanctification, we have gone through kind of the major chapters of the book uh, that I wrote called The Perfection of Our Faithful Wills. And the final section is centered on answering kind of common objections. And now uh, we'll be looking at three specific objections, one or rather a family of objections from R.C. Sproul, the late and great R.C. Sproul, uh, Wayne Grudem, and Millard Erickson. Now, of course, there are other objections that one could name or list, but I'm not going to do those because I think most of them are really esoteric or would go so far down the rabbit hole that I would be spending far more than any of the effort I wrote on writing the book on answering them. So rather than just deal with that, uh, I am just going to do a simple video answering uh, objections from three folks who object to the doctrine of entire sanctification. And so without further ado, let's get this rolling. Uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do after this uh, series is done. Um, I might, well, let me know below, comment below and tell me what you think I should do next. Maybe I'll do some stuff in John. Uh, I don't want to really do anything I'm doing dissertation wise, because I'm going to be doing that for three to six years and I'm probably going to get sick of it. And so I want to keep that a little fresh in my mind and keep it fresh for me. So comment down below some stuff you might be interested in me working on. So without further ado, uh, let us screen share and go through our first kind of stuff. So, uh, of course, uh, by the time you're seeing this, I've got 95 subscribers. It'd be cool to get to 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or a million. Uh, Mike Winger's got 250 plus, I think. Uh, Inspiring Philosophy's got probably 100,000 or plus, I forget. Uh, Trinity Radio's got probably close to 20,000. Soteriology 101's got 40,000. It'd be cool to at least get to 200. I don't know. I, I think I'd be bold over silly if I ever hit a thousand. Uh, but since that's not the case, subscribe and share if you think people would like this or benefit from it. Uh, and yeah, that'd be really cool. Help a brother out. So the next is, so I mentioned R.C. Sproul, Wayne Grudem, and Millard Erickson, uh, three Reformed theologians of varying degrees. R.C. Sproul would probably be over here on the Reformed scale, Wayne Grudem here, and Millard Erickson over here. But the scale is Reformed, so take, take that as you will. And so this is a lengthy quote or two quotes from R.C. Sproul. Uh, the uh, citation is in the book. Uh, I'm not going to reproduce it here. This was a blog post, I believe, on Ligonier Ministries. And Sproul wrote, or Ligonier Ministries wrote, quote, I once encountered a young man who had been a Christian for about a year. He boldly declared to me that he had received, quote, the second blessing and was now enjoying a life of victory, a life of sinless perfection. Now, it's often called the second blessing. Uh, I prefer not to call it that because I think uh, it's a little too esoteric. It's a little too, um, for lack of a better word, um, individualistic and I don't really like it. So you won't hear me call it the second blessing. So uh, already not off to a good start, but that's not because of R.C. Sproul per se, it's because of this young man's uh, intensity, we might say, at least if the story is to be believed. Uh, Sproul says, I immediately turned his attention to Paul's teaching on Romans 7. Romans 7 is the biblical death blow to any doctrine of perfectionism. 
My young friend quickly replied with the classic argument of the perfectionist heresy, namely that Romans seven that in Romans seven Paul is describing his former unconverted state. Now, red flag, the perfectionist heresy. Um, it doesn't behoove me to besmirch the dead, but because Sproul was happily alive when he said this or wrote this, I feel compelled to say that when you attach uh, heresy to any doctrine you don't like. Um, that's not a good way to get educated folks like me to take you seriously. Now, I think I treated Sproul in the book with a lot more respect than he clearly showed my view. Um, but that is to say, I kind of object already to the framing of this. And I think I'll get more into that later. But uh, I explained to the young man that it is exegetically impossible to dismiss Romans 7 as the expression of Paul's former life. Now, notice how Sproul is framing it, dismissing. Uh, exegetically impossible, so on and so forth. So when you're engaging, and this is a good lesson for every Christian, myself included, especially those of us at New Testament or theology, uh, look at how people frame the issue. Look at how people discuss views they disagree with. If they use this sort of language, uh, it strikes, it, it comes across as either overcompensation or overconfidence or a mindset that is hostile to actual engagement. So keep in mind how people frame the issue. You see this in debates on eschatology, on women in ministry, and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's a good teaching moment here. If we're going to take anything out of Sproul's comment, I think this is probably the most we can take out of his objection is how he frames it. We, discuss, we examined the passage closely, and the, the man finally agreed that indeed Paul is, was writing in the present tense. Of course, that interjection again, that is absolutely irrelevant to the discussion, that that doesn't tell you the interpretive, like that, that doesn't tell you what the text is, actually means. It tells you what the text might be saying, but not what it means. And those are two separate things. His next response was, well, maybe Paul was speaking of his present experience, but he just hadn't received the second blessing yet. Which of course, if the story is to be, to be believed, sounds a little bit like the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the great joke about the, um, the man who's convinced that he was dead and then the doctor took a knife, finally, in exasperation, and cut him. And uh, instead of the man saying, ah, oh, I'm bleeding, I must be alive, he said, ah, oh, I guess the dead do bleed. So two things can be true at once. This young man is uh, ignorant and full of passion, and Sproul is capitalizing on his ignorance, which I think is kind of a little distasteful for someone who's a seasoned Bible professor. We should be more interested in cultivating and engaging, not correcting especially over secondary issues or even the third tertiary style issues, but need that needless to say. Uh, and here's Sproul's kind of polemical kind of doctrinal centrism kind of coming on in the next section. The peril of perfectionism, again, look how they frame the issue, is that it seriously distorts the human mind. Yeah. Imagine the contortions through which we must put ourselves to delude us into thinking that we have in, that we have in fact achieved a state of sinlessness. I mean, I'm not that flexible personally, but inevitably the error of perfectionism breeds one or usually two deadly delusions. Deadly, you say. To convince ourselves that we, we have achieved sinlessness, we must either suffer from a radical overestimation of our moral per performance, or we must seriously underestimate the requirements of God's law. The irony of perfectionism is this, though it seeks to distance itself from antinomianism, it relentlessly and inevitably comes full circle to the same error. So that is R.C. Sproul's um, thoughts on Christian uh, perfectionism or entire sanctification. So uh, I'm going to make this point because I think Sproul's material here is probably the most um, shallow, if I'm going to be honest. And I think polemics is not a substitute for reason and argumentation. And Sproul essentially falls into this head first and strikes his head on the bottom of the kiddie pool. Um, I think what you see in Sproul is a classic um, preference for polemics and assertions versus serious argumentation. And I think uh, as Christians, we should be better than this. Uh, and I think Sproul is also operating with a uh, his own ignorance on the doctrine of entire sanctification, and that is we do not achieve anything in isolation from the work of the triune God. So uh, if we believe in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, in that, and you can see a video I've already done on that, on the agency and activity of the Holy Spirit in entire sanctification, um, 
it seems to me that if that's true and that video's argument holds, and I think it does, then Sproul has basically caricatured my view, not my view, uh, caricatured entire sanctification. And I think, and this is a testament to Sproul, I think he is too smart and too learned to make that kind of error in judgment and argumentation. I think he's better than that. So either this is kind of a um, kissing up to your audience, which is possible, or um, a lapse of judgment in terms of engagement. Either way, it's not a good look. And I think, uh, and the reason I include this is not to kick, kick the dead, for lack of a better word. It is to show even uh, brilliant people can fall into the, uh, into the arena of polemics and use polemics as a substitute for reason and argument. So um, I wanna make that point first. And the next bit is most of the objections seem to center on a reading of Romans 7. And as people that know me know, I don't think Romans 7 is describing anything that either the, uh, the passionate young man or R.C. Sproul are talking about. I think Paul is using what's called uh, prosopopoia, which is speech in character. And the person speaking is Adam and the person in Adam. And maybe I'll do a whole video on that. But uh, suffice to say, Romans 7 doesn't mention anything about Paul's conversion or state. Suffice to say, Sproul and the young man are just wrong to use Romans 7. And Millard Erickson falls into the same thing. It's this belief that Romans 7 is speaking of some person's experience that is either Christian or Jewish or Paul, or Paul's a Jewish Christian, you know, Jew or Christian or something like that. But I think a lot of it is a misreading of Romans 7 that's a little more opportunistic than it is exegetically and rhetorically sound. So uh, I think what Sproul essentially does is front load his uh, polemics instead of actually arguing his point. And um, I don't think it holds any water. So I think you get a little more substance with Wayne Grudem. And this is in his first edition of his Systematic Theology. And you can see the reference up top. That is page 750 and following. Assertion one, according to Grudem. It is simply not taught in scripture that when God gives a command, he also gives the ability to obey it in every case. Okay, um, I strongly disagree, but at least he's not um, throwing me under the exegetical bus. And assertion two from Grudem, when Paul commands the Corinthians to make holiness perfect in the fear of the Lord or prays that God would sanctify the Thessalonians holy, 1 Thess uh, 5.23, he's pointing to the goal that he desires them to reach. Note that that's actually not in the text. Paul's not talking about the desire as if it's just a desire. Paul, or he, uh, if, I, if I recall, does not simply does not imply that any reach it, but only that this is the high moral standard toward which God wants all believers to aspire. So essentially assertion two is a sub point of assertion one. I think there's a lot to object to here, but at least there's a little more substance. So let's look at what my response is to Grudem. And I thought this was very telling. Uh, first point is Grudem offers very little exegetical reasoning for his arguments. Uh, first, I mean, I wouldn't deny that Paul has in mind, quote, the goal he desires them to reach at all. I, I think Paul has, a there's a teleological or an ethical kind of component to it. He wants them to achieve or get to this goal. I, but I don't see how that contradicts the position. Um, and I think uh, you'll notice in Grudem's work, especially, is that essentially you get this point of, uh, you think scripture X teaches this. I think scripture Y teaches this more clearly. And so scripture X goes under scripture Y. And you see this kind of subordination of biblical text to other biblical texts, or we might say competing or preferred theological or hermeneutical principles. Uh, you see it with Wayne, uh, Wayne's material on hell or on women in ministry or his view of providence. Um, and so I, I think it's more a matter of uh, certain people, and I'm not denying I'm, that I'm immune from this, but when we have heuristic devices that we prefer, um, any text that challenges or undercuts or just flat out contradicts those heuristic devices is a problem to be uh, uh, figured out, not a text that challenges our view. So, and so I want to encourage all of us, you watching, me, Wayne, although I don't think Wayne, I, I can't, I shouldn't call him Wayne Grudem or Dr. Grudem, if he's watching this, um, 
I think that's something we all need to be aware of just as a good teaching moment. And so Grudem, I think, in the next point offers, I would argue, contradictory claims. He says, it is simply not taught in scripture that when God gives a command, he also gives the ability to obey it in every case. Now, I notice kind of the anthropocentrism of that for uh, the idea that he also gives the ability to obey it. Well, it's it's one of those things where if Paul commands the Corinthians, or when Paul commands the Corinthians to make holiness perfect, the Corinthians, wow, the Thessalonians, I'm, I must have been tired when I read this, the Thessalonians to make holiness perfect in the fear of the Lord, or praise that God was sanctified, da, 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 da. Uh, God tells us to do X, but doesn't give us the ability to do X. I think this is poor reasoning. Um, those who affirm entire sanctification are taking God's law so seriously that we believe that we can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, actually do God's law in the way God wants us done, wants it done. Um, uh, and, and Grudem's entire point essentially underdoes the entire moral reasoning of why uh, God gives laws in the first place. God gives laws or commands or whatever uh, because he wants them obeyed. You know, I, I don't tell my son to stop eating cookies uh, if I don't believe he will listen to me and not eat cookies. Uh, he, I believe he has the capacity to understand what I'm telling him, even if he may not have the willpower. And I think Grudem kind of collapses all of that into this anthropocentric, I would argue, man-centered way of doing things because he may think God gives this ability. But I think at the end of the day, if God tells us to do something, God is not a capricious father who is essentially ordering his kids to lift a hundred pounds, you know, of books, you know, I think the, the overall testimony of scripture is that when God tells us to do something, God expects, expects us to be able to do it. And when we don't do it, God gets angry or God, you know, uh, gets fussy about it. And I think Rudum's point really just doesn't cut a whole lot of exegetical mustard. And you'll notice if you read his systematic theology, he actually doesn't argue exegetically against these texts, or at least the, the common understanding of these texts. It's more just a matter of here's this heuristic device, let's like good, like peanut butter slathered over the bread of this, of this argument, and that'll solve the problem. Or, or deal with, you know, or that's a sufficient answer. And it's like, well, no, you need to show me why my understanding of this text is wrong and why I'm wrong to appeal to this text. Simply saying, oh, uh, this is, there's a teleological component to it when I already agree with that point is, is like shooting a, a shotgun in the bottom of your rowboat. It's like, okay, at this point, you're just sinking. You, you need to actually show me why I'm going in the wrong direction or why the rowboat needs to be turned around or whatever. So I think Grudem is just wrong on this point. And I think it actually does a lot of potential damage to his own arguments about ethics. And you'll notice Grudem in a lot of his material is big on ethics and Christ, the Christian life as a Christian. And it kind of makes you wonder if there's some sort of systematic incoherence with how um, his doctrine of God and his doctrine of humankind and also his doctrine of the Christian life work together. It doesn't seem like there's integration at that point. It seems more like the, the reformed uh, opinion is dragging the dog and the tail of the Bible is kind of wagging, trying to get the dog to change and neither the three uh, agents or yeah, uh, three agents are, are actually working. And so I think there's a lot of problems here theologically and exegetically that Grudem just doesn't solve. Simply saying, oh, this does this, or you know, offering these two points doesn't actually solve the problem when I agree with one point because I believe Paul has a desire that he wants the Thessalonians to be a part of. But just simply saying that doesn't actually answer the question. And so it's, it's an underdeveloped objection on Grudem's part. And Millard Erickson, uh, I just realized I don't have that on here, but I'll summarize. Uh, Erickson's argument essentially boils down to the Romans 7 arguments from, uh, from Sproul. And maybe now is the time to go through that real quick. What Erickson, and Erickson's a lot nicer about it than Sproul, and he's, a little, he's much more in-depth than Grudem. But uh, both Sproul and Erickson appeal to Romans 7 as kind of the paradigm for the person who's continually wrestling with sin. And I think there is a distinct sense of, of an overcommitment to the doctrine of sin versus, an over, versus a reasonable understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And if you begin with your doctrine of God, you know, 
Christology, uh, the doctrine of God the Father, and and doctrine of pneumatology, and those, and you know, doctrine of the Trinity, and you bring all of that together, you run the risk. I just realized there we go. You run the risk of anthropological kind of primacy in this debate. So Calvinists, my Calvinist brothers and sisters, are very happy to assert that. Arminians or Wesleyans or non-Calvinists have a man-centered theology. And I, I was involved with a podcast for about a year called The Most Man-Centered Theology Podcast on the Internet by God's Providence. Uh, it's still up there. You can go find it. It's been essentially discontinued, but the Synergist podcast. But our point was that uh, if you begin with your doctrine of Christ, Christology, then that should color your anthropology, how you view humankind and our ability to respond to God or the human condition and all that. And what I see a lot in the Romans 7 debate and how people kind of use Romans 7 is this kind of belief that Romans, the anthropology asserted in Romans 7 uh, is the guiding principle of all other things. And so when Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that the God of peace might sanctify you entirely, uh, the Roman seven specter is kind of doing this. It's kind of coming over and basically making a, 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 a paradigmatic kind of coding over the text. And I think the problem with that is if Roman seven is that Roman seven isn't saying that Roman seven, I would argue because of echoes of Adam and rhetoric is the first half verses seven through 13 is Paul's compressed retelling narratively of the Adamic story, what Adam went through. And so you've got sin taking Adam down and killing him and doing all these sorts of things. Well, that can't apply to Paul because Paul, as far as we know, unless Tertius is getting very crafty, is still alive when Romans is written. So you people will go, oh, it's, it's symbolic or it's this. It's like, no, it seems to actually have a um, rhetorical literal force. And um, if that's the case, then the person talking in uh, verses 14 through 24, I'm going off memory, uh, if that person, if the echoes of Adam continue on and ripple on, then that person is an Adam. So Paul is essentially speaking as the person in Adam. So it's not a Christian, it's not a Gentile, it's not a Jew. You would say it's broader, broader than that. It is the person who is in Adam as opposed to being in Christ. And if that's the case, then the victory cry at the end is, who will save me or deliver me from this body of death? And then thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the crescendo of Romans 8, you know, there's, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so Romans 7 is not about Paul's conversion experience or his struggle with sin. Paul was not an existentialist in the modern sense. He didn't go around going, uh, oh my gosh, I sinned today. I, I, I didn't give someone their proper change or I was gluttonous. I ate an extra bit of fish when I could have given it to the poor. Paul, there, there's no evidence Paul thought like that. And I think it's kind of this modern projection that is kind of implicit in all of this because especially Protestants, myself, I'm a, it's in my bones, I'm a Protestant. Um, I'm more of a Baptist, you know, um, but there is this kind of assumption in a lot of theology is that we really don't want to be Roman Catholics and we're really concerned with works. That's kind of something we don't like. We're kind of, we're a little allergic to that. And uh, I, I think a lot of people are really concerned with going that route and also falling into legalism. They don't want to be, they don't want to be like the Jewish Pharisees, which is something I think, um, it's a trope that needs to die. It needs to go the way of the dodo or the, the woolly mammoth or the Wookiee or whatever creatures don't are, don't exist anymore. Although Wookiees, um, if you're in the Northwest, maybe you've seen one or two. But the point is, reading Romans 7 as if it describes the Christian experience or Paul's experience or Sproul kind of mentioned that it was exegetically impossible and all this sort of stuff, just misses the force for the trees. It is asking the wrong questions of the text. And when you ask the right questions of the text and you adopt the Adamic reading or another similar sort of reading that is rhetorically plausible, that is exegetically savvy, then Sproul's objection just, it's gone. And same with Erickson's, it's gone. 
And the only objections really boil down to hermeneutical deployments of certain ideas. And that's Grudem's kind of idea. And I think I've shown that Grudem's ideas or his objections don't hold a lot of And so to summarize, the doctrine of entire sanctification is thoroughly a Trinitarian doctrine. It requires the will of God, the Father, it requires the work of the Son, and it requires the agency and co uh, requires cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It is not something we achieve. That's a canard that needs to go to the back of the back of the what what is the phrase it needs to go out like old yeller two in the back of the head and done it is a canard it is an absolute uh, straw man of an argument that has been perpetuated by some within kind of the wesleyan pentecostal tradition or uh folks online it needs to go away it's bad it's wrong stop um and i and so i think excuse me and so, the, yeah, those are the objections. Those are the, the responses I have to it. There are probably other texts, you know, people will talk about present tense verbs and the idea of people still sinning. And it's like, well, yes, not everyone is sanctified immediately. Um, and that's something Grudem also mentions or kind of alludes to. And other people have made that argument, say, in 1 John 1. But I think the problem is the, again, straw man idea that if you become a Christian, then you don't sin anymore. It's like, no. If you are yielding to the spirit, Romans 8 style, and you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And with that life comes a life free from sin. That is not an instantaneous thing. That is progressive in terms of progress. But that doesn't imply that that cannot happen in this life. And so uh, this is a Trinitarian doctrine. It is a doctrine contingent upon human uh uh, participation with the spirit or it presumes a high ecclesi high view of the church that is the church is the body of christ as the place where redemption is found in family and community where brothers and sisters sharpen one another and it is a systematic doctrine it is not a doctrine that rests on a single text even though you could find several key texts that teach it but it rests on a biblical theological framework that takes seriously Christian theology and philosophy, and I would argue is coherent and applicable to daily life. So those who are interested in the doctrine, and this is your first video, welcome. Go watch the other ones and maybe uh, maybe they'll change your mind or at best get you away from the sprawl polemics and into the realm of what well, I disagree for these six reasons. We can have that conversation. You might change my mind, but I think at the end of the day, we need to be better with how we engage theologically. If we are Christians and we're not debating the divinity of Jesus or the authority of scripture or things like that, then we are in a good place to have solid, passionate disagreements about things that matter, but not things that change us in our faith. So uh, at the end of the day, be more like Erickson. Don't be like Sproul. Don't be polemical. Don't be fighty. Don't be condescending. Don't be ignorant. Read, study, and learn. So comment below with some things you would like me to, uh, maybe a series or something like that. Uh, I don't really want to do women in ministry. I'd really rather not. Um, maybe I'll go through with John or something like that. Maybe a Bible study. Yeah, maybe go. There we go. Put, put something down below. Uh, get your friends to comment and share stuff. Uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. I hope you went to church on Sunday. And if you didn't go to church on Sunday, that's fine. Knowing most churches, you can probably go and watch it. So make sure you're praying. Make sure you're reading your Bible. And make sure you're going to church. So blessings to you. And I will see you maybe some other time this week, depending on if he still stays asleep. God bless everyone. Take care. And subscribe. Subscribe.